Hello everyone, this is Fabio Gallerani, founder of the VDM project. Today I have uh, the honor and the opportunity to introduce a renowned expert from our board of advisors in the VDM project, Dr. Alfredo Sedun. But before I do that, I would like to thank you for your continuous support and trust in the VDM project. Before we start, I would like to, of course, uh, bring to the stage uh, Dr. Jerry Sebag, which uh, since 2020 is next to me to the uh, mission to find a better and safer treatment for eye floaters. Dr. Sebag, thanks for being with us today and uh, please. Thank you very much and welcome everyone um, in our uh, global WWW network. And um, we're very privileged to have with us today, Professor Alfredo Sedun, who's the Vice Chair of Ophthalmology uh, at UCLA and the Flora L. Thornton Professor and Dow Chair of Ophthalmology at the Doheny Eye Institute um, in Pasadena. Dr. Sedun is, uh, has graciously accepted to be a member of the Scientific Advisory Board for the uh, VDM project, as well as for the VMR Research Foundation. So let me thank you, Dr. Sedun, for joining us today. Uh, I wanted to begin with a few questions, some of which were submitted by uh, the members of our network. Um, the first concerns the relationship between medical and neurological illnesses and floaters. If you go to the internet, uh, you'll see mention of the relationship between floaters and uh, diseases such as Gaucher disease, multiple sclerosis, lupus, sarcoid, and migraine syndromes. That hasn't been my experience at all in the overwhelming majority of patients who I have uh, evaluated and treated. Those were not uh, illnesses and, and comorbidities. So I am um, curious to know what has your experience been? Well, first of all, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, as you know, I, I, I treasure a number of our different collaborations. Uh, and in regards to your question, uh, an association can exist for at least three different reasons. Uh, a might cause B, B might cause A. Uh, there is going to be uh, some other cause of both of those two. And uh, in these particular cases, I'm unimpressed that there is a, a, a meaningful relationship between the diseases in question and floaters. Uh, first of all, like you, um, I have seen patients with these diseases and seen patients with the floaters, and I've not been impressed that there's a real uh, alignment between the two. But there are problems with the studies. I, I just recently was reviewing one of them that had to do with migraines which makes it very susceptible to what we would call ascertainment bias. The same psychology that might be associated with one disease might be associated with the other. And there might be a tendency for people who have one disease to have access to the sort of doctors that are gonna turn around and complain about the other set of problems. Um, at least I'm not persuaded that there's a real mechanistic connection between. Very good, I, I um, echo that opinion and I wanted to make sure that uh, the members of our audience are, are not anxious about what they might come across uh, on the internet. Uh, drilling down to some ocular related issues, uh, there's an interest in understanding more about the interplay between glasses and floaters. Patients have experienced that changing the shape of their glasses in some instances improves their symptoms of floaters and in other instances, worsens their symptoms of floaters. And my question to you, Dr. Sadoon, is that conceivable? And, and if so, why does that happen? And how could one advise that our patients to have certain types of glasses that might help lessen the symptoms? And, and in particular, do you find that there's any role for polarization of lenses without darkening of the glasses in lessening the symptoms of floaters? Well, speaking in the general, it's very conceivable. Uh, but I suspect that the particulars get complicated and may vary from patient to patient. Glasses do many things in addition to uh, attaining the plane of focus that's most desirable. For example, and one of the things that I think is most relevant here is that they can produce a prismatic effect especially if the correction is strong. 
So if you have thick glasses because of myopia or presbyopia or hyperopia, then if you're looking off axis, and sooner or later you have to look at off, uh, off axis, our eyes are moving around all the time, then there's going to be a, a, a movement of the object as well as a clarity issue. If you're looking off axis and there's a movement of the object, it will move without regard to the floater. So it might move into the floater or it might be moved away from the floater. So if it turns out that a person has a floater that is far enough away from where they're usually looking that doesn't bother them and they were to have a certain type of glasses, suddenly the floater is introduced into the vi vision in a place that is bothersome or vice versa. So I would think this is so complicated to calculate they would come down to trial and error. But it doesn't surprise me if a patient says, I have a favorite frame and glasses because with this I see less floaters. That makes sense. What about the role of polarization of lenses? Do you see any role in lessening glare or any of the symptoms? Well, sure. Uh, since floaters themselves will produce a type of glare, I suppose that while the, floater, the polarization is not going to reduce the glare imposed by the floaters, it's going to reduce the glare in general. So if I'm wearing polarized glasses, especially if I'm looking at the ocean or a pond or even a, a smooth desk, um, that reflection is going to be blocked by a polarization that is orthogonal to it, thus less glare. So altogether, there's less glare. That might be very helpful to some patients. So I guess it depends on the nature of the symptoms. If glare is a prominent component of what people complain about, polarization of lenses might help. And, and please don't misunderstand. It's not also darkening of lenses. It, you can get polarization of your lenses without any tint whatsoever. So that, that could be something that would help patients who complain uh, about glare. That does segue into the question of dark glasses. Uh, is it possible that eyes that are more sensitive to light uh, worsen the perception of floaters? And if so, would dark glasses therefore help? I mean, some patients have had the experience that not wearing sunglasses for a long period of time apparently makes them better able to adapt to eye floaters. So how can this be explained from a neuro-ophthalmology point of view? And what is the interplay between dark glasses and the perception of floaters? Well, I'm not persuaded that darkness per se is an advantage and that most patients with floaters would profit from wearing dark glasses. But there might be a couple of situations that are exceptional. One is in the patient whose floaters are all concentrated centrally. If they wear dark glasses, they're going to have a larger pupil and they'll get more information around their floaters and that might give them a perception of, of less annoyance. Uh, but that's a very special subset. Uh, also, I don't think that floaters are necessarily quite the same as photosensitivity. That is to say, light striking the floaters is going to produce glare and other things that are bothersome to the patient. But their sensitivity to light is not enhanced by the floaters. So in general, I would be surprised if dark glasses were, were that advantageous. You know, extrapolating from <clears throat> that comment about the pupil dilating, there are quite a few patients who have administered, well, it, it actually began in the doctor's office when, as part of the examination to evaluate the health of the eye, drops are put in to dilate the pupils. And during that experience, patients have noted that their symptoms of floaters seem to lessen. The severity is not as bad. And that morphed into patients taking low-dose atropine to purposely dilate their pupils in an attempt to lessen the symptoms of floaters. Um, my experience has been it's a mixed bag. There are people who improve and people who don't improve, but I'm curious to know from an optics perspective what your perception is of the role of pupil dilation in the management of the symptoms of floaters. Well, I think what you said is exactly right. Um, with a larger pupil, you are now also using a larger area of the empty cavity of the eye to look through. If the floaters are concentrated centrally, that's an advantage. If they are not, or if there's a large floater that's off axis, it could even be a detriment. And it reminds me of what we learned with patients who have a particular type of cataract, the posterior subcapsular cataract, which is very much akin to one sort of central floater right in the middle of, of the issue. 
And these patients uh, can do quite a bit better if you mildly dilate them so they can look around it. So I guess the other take home message is that it would be a very good idea to thoroughly characterize the opacities in the vitreous body that are inducing the visual phenomenon of floaters, meaning if you're if your opacities are concentrated centrally, you might uh, improve with pupil dilation. But if they're spread everywhere, then you might not improve with pupil dilation. So I always advise a thorough evaluation of the vitreous body, ideally with ultrasonography. Hopefully, new optical coherence tomography systems will be developed that would enable us to do the same thing with light which we currently do with sound. But um, you can get a really good idea of what's going on inside the vitreous body with, uh, with ultrasound. The uh, last area that I'd like to address in depth, if you could, is the role of neuroadaptation in the management of floaters. Does neuroadaptation actually exist? Because many patients are advised to simply try coping and uh, does this coping work via neuroadaptation? And if it does exist, and if it does work, how could we promote neuroadaptation in patients who are complaining of floaters? Well, neuroadaptation is a real thing, um, sometimes termed neuroplasticity. And it is the fact that the brain can make compensations or adaptations for a number of problems. However, the sort of problems that are most amenable to this are those that can be easily figured out by the brain because they're constant. So for example, we do not notice our own blind spot. We all have one. Each eye has about 15 degrees to the outside of center, an area where there is no retina because the optic nerve is taken up to the space of the retina. But we don't notice it because we're born with it and the brain has quickly said, you know, there's no point paying attention to that area because I can't see in that area. So in fact, the map of the visual field imposed in the brain is missing the blind spot. So that's easy because it's always 15 degrees to the temporal side of the straight. If a floater were to be large and steady, I can imagine that neural adaptation would be very helpful. And it's something that occurs automatically. There's no process uh, to encourage it. In fact, one of the things I find particularly uh, un unpleasant is that there are groups of people who, uh, knowing about neural adaptation, scam patients into giving them very lengthy and expensive courses in order to facilitate this. It's just silly. The brain knows what it's doing and there's nothing you can do to facilitate it that happens automatically. But back to the, the, the nature of your question. If you had something that was constant, the neural adaptation would help on its own. But if the floater is moving around, the brain can't anticipate where it's gonna be next. And while it's still possible that there'd be a little bit of neural adaptation, it's not gonna be nearly as effective. Do you think that maybe there's a relationship between the nature of the floater and the potential for neural adaptation? Uh, more specifically, is it possible that dots that appear in the visual field are more easily managed by the brain than strands and therefore neural adaptation would occur more readily for focal uh, floaters as opposed to linear ones? Yes, but I would put it in slightly different terms. Neural adaptation works particularly well at canceling out what we don't see. So a floater that blocks our vision is the sort of thing that the brain can quickly say, I'm going to fill in that area based on other information I know. So a patient who looks at a checkerboard who happens to have damage to his retina that obscures one of the squares would soon learn to see the entire checkerboard because the brain can extrapolate what should have been there. What neuroadaptation does very poorly is deal with positive visual phenomena. A positive visual phenomena is seeing something that's not there. And unfortunately, most floaters, especially the squiggly ones, especially if they're moving, are positive visual phenomena. They're not a gap in our vision as much as they are an intrusion into our vision. And the brain is, of course, always tuned to look for new things that are intruding uh, that it should be paying attention to, be made aware of. So I think that floaters are not particularly susceptible to the positive benefits of neural adaptation. Thank you. Uh, before my closing comments, I'd like to invite Fabio to pose any questions that he might have. 
Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Sadun. Uh, very insightful. I was uh, thinking, you know, about the neural adaptation, especially because it's been for me six years, and for many patients and members of the VDM project, many even ten to twenty years, and um, most of them. I would like to go back to the influence of dark sunglasses on the effect uh, of eye floaters because. As soon as you get eye floaters, suddenly you tend to put uh, sunglasses because, uh, especially for the center one, you start seeing them less. But as you mentioned, you start highlighting a wider sp space of the, of the vision and you start seeing more, you know, the side one. So, yeah, you see them less in the, in the center, but you see them more in the side. And, you know, wearing sunglasses, especially in uh, Close spaces where you normally never wear them uh, also have a negative social impact. So I did an experiment myself <coughs> of avoiding sunglasses completely during the day, wearing a special shape type of glasses, and that improved my uh, neuro adapt adaptation, meaning that I don't suffer more of light sensitivity. So my final and most important question about this, since we cannot neuroadapt to intrusion and we cannot for now uh, like do most like we, we, we need to bear with the symptoms basically. Um, is that a viable way to encourage sufferers not to wear sunglasses too early and get into that deep hole that get worse and worse and worse but try to readapt your eye to light and use light instead of darkness to cope with floaters i think i understand your question and i have two impressions yeah. uh, the first i'd like to suggest is that one size does not fit all uh, the position and nature of people's floaters are going to be so variable that what will help in one person might hurt in the other. Yes, yes. And the other is that experimentation, I think, is key. I'm glad that you did some experimentation and found yeah. what worked for you. Yes. Um, I think that until we get uh, Dr. Uh, Sabag's uh, 3D ultrasound and, and a way of really mapping floaters in a way that ties the theory to the practicality, mm. till then, the most effective thing to do is for every patient to experiment for themselves, recognizing the different glasses, different shape uh, lenses, dark glasses are all variables they can play with. And I would suspect that some of these things will help some and hurt others. Uh, and then they, they can even make up uh, a program of not only what helps them, but under what lighting conditions it helps them. Mm -hmm. What might work well in sunlight may be a very yeah. bad thing to do in a heavy or overcast day. That's what happened right now with the big storm. Sure. But these sorts of things are so complicated that trial and error is probably uh, our best bet right now. Yeah, yeah. And also uh, another point that I experiment is that, you know, when you enter in a white room, especially with white, uh, like flooring, white walls, the light reflect on different surfaces, making floaters worse. But as soon as you stop, like in the flooring, you put like a wood flo flooring, or something that stops the reflection, suddenly the floaters become less bothersome and immediately a white wall becomes not unbearable as before. Is there any optics sure. explanation of why? That, 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 that ties in very closely to the comment that was made by Dr. Sabag a little earlier about polarizing lenses. Mm. When you walk into a room that has flat surfaces that are light colored, such as a white wall, mm. you're actually producing some polarity of light. And yeah. so the light is coming from a direction, hitting the wall and coming off, and in that direction is polarized. Whereas if you have softer textures and, and things that are gonna break down the polarization, uh, you're going to be having something equivalent to um, a, a, a polarizing glasses because it doesn't allow for strong polarity of light coming in. Strong polarity of light, light bouncing off of a surface, whether it be a glass coffee table or, or a, a swimming pool is going to be particularly irksome to floaters. Mm, mm, exactly. So maybe even polarized uh, eyeglasses, not sunglasses, can help 
people work in, in offices because I have the privilege to be an entrepreneur. As you can see in my back, I have a blue wall and I, I don't have any more white walls. But somebody working in a, a neon environment with white, maybe polarizing eyeglasses can help them to reduce the, the negative effect of white. Yes, surface. it's definitely worth a try. But just as we mentioned before, um, the trouble with some polarizing glasses is, is that they're also dark. So mm. the point would be to go on the internet and find polarizing glasses that are completely clear. Clear, clear. And that's that, exactly what I what I recommend yeah. to my patients is not get uh, polarized sunglasses. And unfortunately, those are the ones that are most readily available. Uh, but perhaps the ones who have central opacities would benefit from the pupil dilation from uh, the dark glasses and uh, also benefit from the polarization of, of the light. So uh, I have found this extremely informative and I hope our audience has as well. I'd like to thank Dr. Sadoon for his expertise and wisdom and time. Uh, but by the way, I should point out for our audience uh, who may or may not be familiar with how we use measurements of contrast sensitivity uh, in evaluating the severity of the impact of vision degrading myodysopsia on patients. We have done this in hundreds and hundreds of patients and found it to be extremely useful as an objective quantitative measure of the impact of floaters on vision. And it was all Dr. Sadoon's original idea to measure contrast sensitivity in these patients that led to that extremely valuable tool. So we thank him for that, as well as all of the other brilliant contributions that he has made to our field and to better the lot of humanity, uh, but also for his time today. Thank you so very much. You are much too kind, but it's my pleasure to be here, and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sadun, and thanks to anyone and everyone supporting the VDM project. Thank you very much.